We've muted all your microphones to facilitate this webinar going easily. Now, without further ado, let's begin the webinar. We are COURSED. It stands for Centre for Affordable Water and Sanitation. We are a water sanitation hygiene NGO or WASH charity. We provide support for domestic non-network systems. We have over a thousand client organizations in over a hundred countries to whom we provide our services. We support our clients by walking beside organizations to help them start up projects, improve the quality of projects, or scale up their projects. The services we deliver to support this are training workshops, education and training resources, consulting support, and action research. This short introductory webinar is a small but not insignificant part of that service. The webinar today is to support improved understanding of the basics in household water treatment and safe storage options. The team for this webinar today is Olivia Mills. He is the course director of communications. He previously had a role as an international technical advisor, and he will be supporting us on the keyboards, addressing your comments as they come in the chat box. Clark Foster is course international technical advisor support officer. He will be supporting us on the technical side to make sure you are receiving this loud and clear. And me, I'm Aaron Tanner. I'm course International Education and Training Advisor and I'll be presenting to you today. Now we've introduced ourselves and I'd like to take a quick poll of you, the participants, so I can get a better feel for who we are with. So up on your screen there should be a poll and it should be saying in what roles are you attending this webinar on household water treatment and storage. I notice there are some of you just joining now. Um, I'm sorry we might have started a little bit early, uh, but not very. You've not missed anything important. We've just got a poll up on the screen, so if you could fill out what is your role in attending this webinar, and then we can speak to that a little bit. Great. Okay, we've got our comments back, and it seems like many, quite a mix there. We've got some, many working in wash. Some are the, probably the same people are working household water treatment. Some are just thinking about becoming active in wash, and just because it's interesting to me, something to do on a Wednesday. So that's good. It's a good bunch of people. I look forward. To, I hope this uh, webinar will um, meet your needs. And as stated before, this is an introductory level, level webinar, and we hope by the end of this webinar, you'll be able to discuss the different household water treatment and safe storage methods, list and describe main criteria for, for evaluating household water treatment and storage options, and be better able to begin the process, process of evaluating and selecting household water treatment technologies. To take an overview of what we'll be looking at over the next 55 minutes, we will first introduce you to a multi, the multi-barrier approach, followed by a look at what is house water, household water treatment and safe storage, and then we will introduce you to the principal technologies used in household water treatment, sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection. Finally, we will help you build up some criteria on how to select appropriate technologies. Firstly, I want to introduce you to the multi-barrier approach. Course advocate using the multi-barrier approach for all household water treatment systems, as we believe it is the best way to reduce your risk of drinking unsafe water. Each step incrementally reduces health risks. 
Step one is source protection. Step two, three and four are sedimentation followed by filtration followed by disinfection. The fourth and final step of the multi-barrier approach is the safe storage of water while it awaits for consumption. Implementers traditionally may rely on a one-barrier approach. This makes for a more vulnerable system. The multi-barrier approach ensures the implementer a robust system. It does so by a series of actions to remove or reduce the number of pathogens in the water up until the point of consumption. In this webinar, we are going, not going rather, to focus on source protection because we don't have time. We will instead focus on the final four steps, two to four, of the multi-barrier approach. Sedimentation, filtration, disinfection, and safe storage. Household water treatment is the main subject of the topic of today. When we at course talk about household water treatment, we're talking about one or more of the following processes. Sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection. There are many different types of household water treatment options available. So I'd like first for you to tell us about the systems you use or advocate for your communities. I'm gonna open a poll, it should be out there on your window. What household water treatment methods are, are used in your country or your communities? Please take time to think about it and fill it out. Right, it seems that everyone who's, voted, who's wanted to vote it has voted. I'm sorry if you missed the, the option. It seems, well, there's quite a nice and even spread there. Um, chlorine seems to be the, the preferred uh, and common, most common method of treatment. Um, well, and boiling a close second. Other kinds of filtration, um, have, have scored slightly lower. So, and biosan filters are represented there as well. Right, so moving through the processes of the household water treatment. Sedimentation is important in household water treatment as it will reduce the turbidity that's a, those are, that is particles in the water as well as the percentage of pathogens in the water. Water that is clear and you can see through is typically low in turbidity, while water that is murky, muddy and you can't th see through is high in turbidity. Sedimentation is a process of allowing, allowing the particles in the water to fall to the bottom. The process of sedimentation is called settling. This process can be supported using additives called coagulants, which can be chemical or natural. Some studies have shown that pathogens in the water can be reduced by up to 50% just through sedimentation. Effective settling typically requires to let the water settle for one day and one night, then remove the clearer water from the top by slowly pouring into another container. Having more than one container to settle is ideal to ensure you always have settled water available. Settling eliminates the big particles along with the potential contaminants and pathogens that are attached to those larger particles. You must always make sure that your containers used for settling are not mixed up with containers used further down the multi-barrier approach such as those containers that might be used for safe storage. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about coagulants. Some particles find it very difficult to settle to the bottom of a container and remain suspended in the liquids. 
The role of coagulants is to encourage particles to bond together, making them heavier, heavier and more likely to settle to the bottom. Coagulants therefore accelerate the settling process. Chemical co coagulants that are common are aluminium sulfate and alum potash. In the slide here we have pictures of examples of these. Other options may include polyaluminium chloride, ferric sulfate or ferric chloride. Natural coagulants may also be used, although they are not available everywhere. Some natural co coagulants are moringa seeds and prickly pear. Both can be used as a natural coagulant after some preparation. So a quick poll on coagulants just to keep you alert. Have any of you, uh, are any of you aware of any people in your communities that work with coagulants and if so which ones? Right, a little bit of everything it seems, um, uh, with predominantly other or I don't know. Um, so it seems that only a small res respondent uh, amount of respondents use or are aware of any form of coagulant being used. So sedimentation. Close the Sedimentation, sorry about that, can remove up to 50% of the pathogens, therefore reducing the load on the filtration system. Typically, a filter will operate, operate less efficiently or require more frequent maintenance regimes if being subject to high levels of turbidity. So sedimentation though, however, is not alone, is not enough. Filtration can remove smaller pathogens than sedimentation. It will remove many of the pathogens that are not, that are not removed by sedimentation. The rate and efficiency of removal is variable and will depend on what filter technology you select, however. The net process of treatment filtration is the one that typically gets the most attention. We'll briefly discuss these five filtration technology options with you. Cloth filtration, biosand filtration, ceramic pot filter, ceramic candle filter, and the membrane filter. These represent some of the most common forms of filtration in household water treatment. Cloth filtration is a very simple example of filtration. A clean piece of cloth can be used to strain sand, silk, clay and some pathogens out of the water. You can use any cotton cloth that is fi fine and tightly woven, such as a sari cloth. The cloth should be folded into a few layers and tied over a clean container. Afterwards, you should wash the cloth with clean water before using it again. Cloth filtration is very effective for removing large particles and pathogens. A sari cloth, it is said, folded seven, seven times on itself, has shown in studies that, is, that it is able to remove the bacteria that causes cholera, Vibrio cholera. That has the size of 20 microns. You can see also in the slide above, the older cloth may be preferable to, to, than a newer cloth, as the yarn is looser and creates more opportunities to catch the particles and the pathogens. The biosand filter can be made out of concrete or plastic and it is a box filled with layers of gravel and then sand. Water is simply poured into the top of the biosand filter and collected 
in a safe storage container below. Pathogens and turbidity are removed by physical and biological processes in the filter sand. If operated and maintain, maintained appropriately, the filter can last over 10 years. A ceramic pot filter is usually made from clay mixed with ground combustible material like sawdust, rice husks and coffee husks. When the pot is fired, the combustible material burns leaving small pores in the ceramic through which water will slowly seep. Colloidal silver may then be added to help with path pathogen removal. Water is then poured into the top of the ceramic pot and is collected in the container below that will typically have a tap or spigot. Therefore, this system also provides safe storage as well of the treated water. Manufacturers typically suggest replacement of the ceramic pot components every two to five years. The ceramic candle filter filters are hollow cylinders that are usually made from clay mixed with a combustible material like sawdust, rice husks and coffee husks. When, again, the clay is fired, the combustible material burns, leaving small pores in the ceramic, through which the water will sleep, seep slowly. Colloidal silver is typically applied to the ceramic, and this is used to help with pathogen removal. One or more candles are attached into the bottom of a container. Water is poured into that container, and it flows through the candle and is collected in the container below that has a tap at the bottom. This system, again, will provide safe storage of the purified water. Manufacturers typically suggest the replacement of ceramic candles every two and possibly for up to five years, depending on the make and its size. Membrane filters are becoming increasingly common. These are sometimes uh, referred to as hollow microfiber filters and have microscopic pores. There are many different types and each have different pore sizes. Types you may have heard of include the live straw, soya and Nerox. They're different, different brands of micro uh, membrane filters. Due to their industrial production, they can usually guarantee these very small pore sizes and, are so, and so are very, very effective at filtering pathogens. Most of the membrane filters used in developing contacts, contacts work by gravity. The two in the slide here have a reservoir followed by the filter membrane and some systems have integrated self safe storage. Depending on the product and the design they have different lifespans. The filters will also vary in terms of maintenance regimes and how robust they are in the field long term. The examples you can see above are the live straw and the soya filter. So keep alert now, I'm going to send you a quick poll. Which type of filter do you think is the most appropriate for the context where you work? Cloth filtration, biosand filter, ceramic pot filter, ceramic candle filter or the membrane filter? All right, let's see what we've got here. Okay, so it seems many of you are interested in, in promotion of the biosand filter, the ceramic pot filter, membrane filters. In fact, there's a little bit for all of them. They are all, of course, have an appropriate time and place. And we'll talk about how to select the appropriate filter for your communities later on in this presentation. I'm just... So... Disinfection is the last step in household water treatment processes. It's to ensure that all the pathogens are removed. The most common household disinfection methods are 
chlorine, solar disinfection, and boiling. Pathogens hide behind suspended tar particles in turbid water and hence are very difficult to eliminate. To improve the effectiveness of disinfection methods, course will always recommend that you settle the water before disinfecting it. Boiling is considered the world's oldest and most common and one of the most effective methods for disinfecting water. Pathogens are killed when the temperature reaches 100 degrees Celsius. Course recommends boiling water for one minute and adding one minute per 1,000 meters of elevation to ensure all the pathogens are destroyed. I repeat, boiling is, a highly, effective, is highly effective at removing pathogens. Chlorine is a popular chemical used to disinfect drinking water. There are many different types of chlorine that are available. For example, sod sodium hypochlorite and sodium troclosine. When added to water, chlorine releases hydrochloric acid, which reacts with the microorganisms and kills them. There are s several different brands of, brands of chlorine products that have been manufactured specifically for household water treatment. With chlorine, you need to dose your water at least 30 minutes before consumption. With correct dosing, there should be a residual chlorine, which will continue to provide protection for your water from recontamination. Chlorine dosing is the only system water treatment method that prevents recontamination of water in this way. way. Solar disinfection or SODIS uses the rays from the sun to kill pathogens in the water. It can be used to disinfect water, water of small quantities with lower turbidity. Households fill transparent non-colored plastic bottles made from polyethylene and place them in direct sunlight. Water can be used directly from the bottle to avoid recontamination. The effectiveness is dependent on the weather, but it's typically recommended six hours on a sunny day will be sufficient. Two, two days when it's cloudy, and this system really isn't appropriate in low light conditions, i.e. where there is persistent heavy rain cloud cover. So I'm gonna go to a quick poll again. Why is it important to, in fact, this is more of a quiz. Why is it important to disinfect water after sedimentation and filtration? Well, what have we got? To kill the last pathogens that remain in the water, um, to avoid future contamination, it's a good habit and all the answers are correct. Well, it's hard to get it wrong, totally wrong, because all the answers are correct. Have we got any comments on that? No? Okay, right. So, if we could close the poll. Right, we have looked at the dominant technologies for household water treatment, sedimentation, filtration, and now since disinfection. Returning to the bigger picture, to the multi-barrier approach, course believes that the multi-barrier approach is the best way to reduce the risk of drinking unsafe water. Each step in the process from source protection to water treatment and safe storage provides an incremental health risk reduction. The final step in the multi-barrier approach is safe storage. It is essential for WASH practitioners to examine water storage and water handling practices in a household. This is because it's not uncommon to see household water treatment processes that are undermined by poor water handling practices that then recontaminate the water after it has been purified. 
In the subsequent slide, we have some examples of water storage containers that are found in communities. Please take a minute to look at these containers, commit them to memory, and then decide which container is usually used for storing water in the communities you work with, and then we'll go to a poll. So what we had there was a bucket, a brass jar with a plate lid, a large jug, some Oxfam safe storage water storage container and a plastic jerry can. Which of these containers is usually used for storing water in the communities you work with? Okay, the results are up. Very exciting. 33% say the communities they work with use buckets. 38% just ahead, plastic jerry cans. Some have experienced and a lesser amount for the other three options. The Oxfam safe storage container, large judge, and the brass jar with the plate or lid. So, one of those options stands out quite clearly. It is the Oxfam safe storage option. And I want to talk about this quickly, not just because it's an excellent safe storage container, but also because when describing its characteristics, we can see some of the poor water storage practices that we're trying to avoid and the things we have to consider when selecting safe storage options. So what are the key characteristics of a safe, safe container? Well, one, you can see quite clearly it's got a lid. The lid here is to stop people and animals and bugs and things getting into our purified water. Followed, following that, we have a spout to pour the water easily from. That way, people do not have to open the top or enter into the top and contaminate the water in order to remove it. This, although it's hard to tell from this slide, is supposed to illustrate a non-transparent container. The reason we select non-transparent containers is because transparent uh, containers can promote algal growth within them. Also, this larger lid is easy to clean, so you can clean it. It's got a broad, wide base base, sorry, so you don't knock it over, and break it or damage it. The final one is probably less, least applicable to the Oxfam safe storage container, and that is locally available. So when it does break, as all things inevitably will do, it can be replaced locally. Just while we're here on the subject of water containers, a little reminder, it is important to use a different container to get water from the source than the ones that you use to treat, treat, uh, store treated water. Right, a little refresher. In the multi-barrier approach, what should you do before and after water treatment to reduce the risk of waterborne illnesses? We'll go to a poll or a quiz. Okay, what do the poll, poll say? Protect, source, and safely store the water. This is good, because we were trying to teach you about the multi-barrier approach. If you close the poll. And we predominantly got the right answers. Of course, all of them are individually correct, but both of them, both protect the water source and safe storage, are the two functions of the multi-barrier approach that sit either side of household water treatment. But, 
now we now we now we recognize that the real question is how do we select from the different water treatment options the right one for our communities here we are entering the final part of this presentation you will now be f familiar with the multi-barrier approach what is household water treatment and safe storage the principal technologies for water treatment and we have introduced you to the characteristics of safe water storage and handling the final part of this session will help you to organize your thoughts when selecting technologies for household water treatment and storage. So what is the criteria for evaluating household water treatment and storage? There are so many options and many people have selected different technologies in different contexts. And many people have also selected this different technologies in the same context. So obviously this needs some examination and how do we do it? At course we like to break this down into four criteria to consider. We like to ask is it acceptable? Is it effective? Is it appropriate? And how much does it cost? Effective is how well does the technology perform? It can be thought of in terms of three main components. Quality, what is the quality of the water that is um, produced by the filter? Quantity, what quantity is made available through the treatment system and is it well matched to the demand? Water source, this is whether or not the influent water to your system is well matched to the system. A water source may be high or low in pathogens, high or low in turbidity, it may also have other contaminants such as heavy metals, arsenic, fluoride and other chemicals to consider. After an assessment of these factors, we should have established how effective our household water treatment system is and be able to compare them against other technologies. Appropriate is how well does the technology fit into people's daily lives. That means, is it lo local availability? Are the parts and inputs easily accessible locally to those communities or households? Time, does the functioning of the filter work well within the schedules of the households and the users? Operation maintenance, this refers to how easy the filter is to operate, how easy it is to maintain, what's the regimen like and how does that work with the householders and users? And lifespan is how long will it last? This is typically determined by the weakest components of the system and their availability for replacement or repair locally. So when ad address, having looked through these key criteria, you will now have a better understanding if you, of the technology's fit into people's daily lives. Or you will be able to respond to the question, is the household water treatment and storage system a good fit to the household and the community? I might add these criteria are not ex exhaustive and you may find more appropriate sub-criteria for your own projects. But these are the most common ones that we and our clients have found useful. You may then turn your attention to cost, although these, these criteria, acceptability, effectiveness, appropriateness and cost, are not presented in any particular order or hierarchy. You may then, so cost is what are the costs for the user and the project. That can be termed in terms of initial investment costs. Can the user afford the technology? Can the project afford the technology? Does the technology represent good value for money? Or in terms of operational costs, can the user afford to maintain and replace its parts when needed, any inputs that might be required, or can the project afford the technology in terms of how to maintain and replace its parts indefinitely if the user will not be able to? Of course, if your solution fails to be well suited to the cost demands of the environment or the household, your solution will not be sustainable. Acceptability is about what the people think of the technology. That could be in terms of taste, odor, or color of the water. Ease of use, or does it look complicated or sound complicated for them to use? There are cultural considerations, i.e. 
does, does are there any particular aspects of the, the filter that might be um, considered repugnant or un, unhealthy in the way that the system operates? And those can be embedded, deeply embedded in the beliefs and cultures of the communities you work in. Reputation. Has the community heard negative, had or heard of negative experiences with parts of the system? And are there reasons why this system will or will not be easily accepted? Desirability is, is it wanted and is there a demand for it? And marketability is, can it be sold? Because we might be intending to sell our household water treatment or ideally we would like to be selling it. Ultimately, if they don't like the water it offers, they won't use it. Or if they don't like the package the water treatment process comes in, they also won't use it. Failing this hurdle, as much as any of the others, will result in the household, household water treatment and safe storage system that falters and ultimately fails again. At course, these four criteria we commonly apply to support any WASH implementation decision. Effective. How well does the technology perform? Appropriate, how well does the technology fit into people's daily lives? Cost, what are the costs for the user and the project? And acceptability, what will people think of the technology? So now you're familiar with the criteria that we use and we advocate for evaluating household water treatment and safe storage systems. We also advocate this criteria for any WASH assessment. But I'm going to present you with a little exercise. Before I run this, I want to say that at the end of this presentation, we're going to be sending you out an evaluation form. Um, so when this webinar is over, there will be a pop-up on your window. It will have an evaluation form. We'd really be grateful if you could fill it in for us and pass it back for it to me and then we can look at how this webinar met your expectations and address it. So, the exercise for you guys to work on is there's a family of seven, they live in an isolated community with little access, no market or stores, and the water source is river water and it's very turbid. Looking for the cheapest option possible you are, the children do not like the taste of chlorine and the children are frequently sick. In consideration of the characteristics, the criteria of this family, what technologies would you recommend? So I'm going to give you a few minutes to have a look at the, uh, the uh, scenario we've given you and then we'll go and we'll give you some if you want, it might help you to jot them down if you have a piece of paper available. And then we'll go to the poll. So we've given you five options to choose from in terms of our exercise and if you need me to jog your memory with re regards to the scenario, it's a family of seven people, they live in an isolated community with very little access, there are no markets or stores, the water source is river water and it's very turbid and we're looking for the cheapest option possible. The children do not like the taste of chlorine and the children are frequently sick. What do we do? What water filter do we apply to this community? So many to choose from.
Okay, interesting little poll there. What have we got as the result? Well, 50% of our respondents promoted the biosand filter. 24% um, of our respondents looked at sedimentation, stomach candle, and boiling. 5% went for the prickly pear and 21% sedimentation and sodas. And nobody went for ceramic candle filter and chlorine. Um, uh, so, uh, what can I say? What, uh, what, it's certainly in terms of nobody selected ceramic candle filter and chlorine. And so that's very good that nobody did that because obviously the children don't want to drink the water from chlorinated. If you use the group, don't want to, don't accept the water supply you're offering them, then it's never going to get used. In terms of uh, the biosand filter, a large proportion of you went forward with this option. Of course, this biosand filter is very good, but it wasn't a, uh, we didn't really present you a multi-barrier approach. Uh, so this, in this scenario, there's high turbidity. Um, so without good sedimentation first, the biosand filter probably would be put under a lot of pressure and would have either a very heavy maintenance regime uh, and so really probably we would I would not go for the biosand filter in this in this scenario because it would end up with a very low flow rate and therefore you'd lose the quantity of water required or you'd end up with a very high maintenance regime which might be hard to uh, maintain. Um, ceramics candle filter and um, boiling water well, this is an okay option. It has all the three sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection through boiling. Of course, the ceramic candle filter may, may need replacing. Um, so we'd have to do some, and well, not may, does need replacing in within two to five years. Um, it, uh, but if it did fail, they're still boiling the water, so the users are still protected. Um, there may be a question about whether the um, uh, ceramic candle filter is a available in the stores where this community might have access to, although we already clear that they do not have direct access to stores or the market. Also there's a factor with boiling water is how are there, are there enough sufficient re resources around to encourage boiling water. So if there aren't, isn't a lot of brushwood around and it would and or briquette making opportunities or ways to find a fuel source for boiling water, this might be quite a, a, um, a challenge, a resource challenge for that community. Um, sedimentation and sodis was one of the options. Um, this has two components of our multi-barrier approach, sedimentation and disinfection. If the weather is fairly dependable and is, is good, then obviously this can work. Uh, there is a high level of, of um, turbidity and whether sedimentation will be sufficient to, um, uh, without a additive like a coagulant, like prickly pear, um, so this will, uh, may not it may not be effective. So it depends, will not be effective in high turbidity water, therefore it depends whether the sedimentation process is effective at reducing all the suspended or much of the uh, suspended particles in that water. Prickly pear and cactus also might be appropriate. We have a question, will the prickly pear um, be available locally? Obviously if it is, that's an advantage. Um, and so uh, that would definitely reduce the turbidity of the water effectively. Um, again, a weather question with the SODIS, is it a nice dry environment? I mean, really, in truth, we haven't given you enough information to the right to make, make the complete decision for this community. And there are some clear no-go areas, at least, that we can identify. There are some options that are worth further exploration, really. And we can use these four criteria that we talked of before. Um, and with consideration of the multi-barrier approach we've presented here today, today. You with your communities will typically begin to assess what options work best for them. If you fail to address all these four criteria systematically, your household water treatment system may not stand up to scrutiny or long-term use, or long-term efficacy, let's say. More importantly, 
uh, you may, more importantly, um, we may fail to protect the people effectively from the water-related illnesses and diseases. So, I hope this this really concludes our presentation today. It's, uh, uh, we're running a bit um, uh, quicker than I expected. Um, and so we're going to take an opportunity before I properly close to let uh, Olivier Mills, who's our communications director, introduce you to some of the resources that are available on the internet. I'm just going to, do you have control? Hi. Um, so I'd like to present just some of the extra resources. This was obviously a short uh, presentation uh, and so we weren't really able to get into some of the details of all these technologies and options. Um, so CAST has a website that um, we have most of our resources available to you. And um, I'm just going to give myself a presentation view. So if you go to if you go to um, resources.cast.org, um, we have over a thousand different uh, education and training materials available on a variety of topics. And if you do um, select the household water treatment um, topic, you can easily use the search bar uh, uh, household water treatment. And um, it will give you a list of different resources that are available on that topic. Um, the manual itself is a is a quite a large document, and we have it in multiple languages, which includes pretty much what we've presented, but in much further detail. We also have a variety of um, fact sheets, and these fact sheets have there are I think over twelve different fact sheets um, covering in detail some of the technologies that are available. Um, that we some of which we presented today. So I do recommend downloading those um, so you can have a good look. The access to this website is free and you just have to register to be able to download. So we have a full list of the technologies available there. If you are going to be training others on household water treatment, um, we do have trainer material that is available for you. So if you do household water treatment and then trainer, um, you can find um, the full training trainer manual and uh, the trainer manual is designed for people who are delivering training on this topic. So if you're going to train others on household water treatment, we recommend looking at our trainer manual, which includes um, a full detail of lesson plans and presentations and poster pictures if you're working with communities who have um, limited uh, literacy. Uh, so we highly recommend looking at the trainer manual on household water treatment and gives you the availability to present this topic to others within your organization or within the communities that you do work with. We have a few summary sheets so I just recommend browsing the website. There's probably over um, 20 to 30 different resources in household water treatment available on this website. If you have any further questions, um, please do email us. We'll uh, in the chat box. We'll put the email address. It's support at cost .org. Um, We can help you with any specific questions as you are working with your projects. Cost has a, a number of international technical advisors that travel around the world, and we also have partners in uh, a number of countries which can provide direct support to you if you, for example, piloting a project. Um, so a lot of people when they haven't done household water treatment might start up a, a small demonstration project to see what technologies work and what don't. Um, we can help you with that, uh, help you set it up and based on the experience we have working with um, hundreds of clients around the world and help you sort of figure out some kinks as you get along um, in starting or evaluating any of your projects. So don't hesitate to get in touch with us at support at cost.org and uh, we'll be happy to help you out. I'll pass it back to Aaron Wright. Great. Um, 
thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. I want to um, thank, if I can, uh, Clark, who has diligently been maintaining the airways for you in technical support, and Olivia, who you just heard from now, who has been responding to you on chat as rapidly as humanly possible. And I just want to conclude that we will be um, responding to any questions that we haven't managed to um, ha haven't managed to cover in the uh, webinar so far. And before I sign off, so as you can see, just to familiarise yourself, there's Olivia, next to him Aaron Turner, and Clark Foster. Right. So just before I sign off, I just want to repeat. In the future, there are these downloadable materials that Olivia just introduced you to. They're on household, household water treatment and safe storage, but there are also on any wash, wash uh, elements. Course provide workshops and trainings globally. So if you're interested in receiving trainings directly and workshops directly, you can look at our, our training uh, plans, which are all on the website. Also, you can contact us, us directly if you if you don't have the information you can find there on when the next trainings are and what trainings are available. Of course, if you have specific project queries, it is course role to support more effective WASH programming, and we seek to help people through consultancy where, where we can. If we can't don't have the in-house expertise, we will help put you in contact with expertise that are local to you. In terms of online training. Keep your eyes peeled. There's another excellent webinar to be hosted on the 28th of June. Um, this is on the subject of, uh, sorry, not June, October, 28th of October. Um, the subject is environmental sanitation. I thank you again for your participation, and we, of course, wish you every success in your project.